I guess I should explain how I got uh, interested in this subject, all right? Uh, in most of, uh, well, in almost every book on, on JFK, they discuss the, um, the Bay of Pigs, they discuss the missile crisis, and they discuss Kennedy's uh, decision not to uh, send combat troops into Vietnam at the end of 1961. And so, that's, that's fine, okay, but well, I began to think, why did he not send in the Navy to bail out the Bay of Pigs? Because as we know, Nixon would have done that, because JFK called him after the first day of the crisis and said, go ahead, declare a beachhead and, and send in the Marines. He didn't do that, all right? During the whole debates in the White House during the fall of 1961, he was essentially the only guy saying, no, we we're not going to send in combat troops. All right? And then, during the missile crisis, you know, he would carry and dodge and end up refusing to even use surgical strikes, all right, to take out the missiles that were already there. And like I said, everybody talks about this, but nobody tries to explain why, all right? And so, the other thing that I, I uh, interested me about this subject was, um, if we go from that kind of attitude and we go to the next slide, uh, which these are the candidates for the last election. We know the kind of record these guys have. <laughs> you know, Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton in Libya. You know, Trump is already you know bombed over there in in, in Syria, etc. You know, well, this seemed to me to make a kind of interesting historical journey, okay, all right? And so I, so I decided to try and do my best to try and figure out, you know, how, how this happened, where you have actually both parties now having almost no qualifications to go ahead and use violence as the first arrow in the quiver. Whereas with Kennedy, you know, it was always last, and most of the times it didn't come at all. All right? Right. So, next slide, please. So, this presentation is going to demonstrate with facts and data that JFK's foreign policy was not reformist, but it was revolutionary. And when he was killed, that policy died shortly after. But to understand why it was revolutionary and why it had to die, we have to understand what Kennedy was rebelling against. Next, please. This is a very important point right here. This is a direct quote from Kennedy and Harris Walford, his civil rights advisor, uh, before the 1960. Democratic Convention in Los Angeles. We have to win because if it's Johnson or Symington, it will be just more of the Douglas Atchison, the same Cold War foreign policy all over. I really like this quote for a couple of reasons. Number one, contrary to a kind of majority mythology, 
it tells me that before he enters the White House, he already has these ideas. Whereas, you know, Jim Douglas' book, which I like a lot, all right, has this thing that a cold warrior turns. That's the tagline on the book. That somehow this transformation did not come until after the missile crisis. All right, where my thesis is that his new foreign policy was already changed, had already been formulated before he went into the White House. And he also understands how different he is from the other people in the Democratic Party. All right? And that, you know, and boy, is that ever true with Johnson, as we're going to see. Yeah, but, you know, the, he, he equates Johnson, you know, with John Foster Doubles. All right? Let's go to the next slide. See, George Ball, who was a uh, Undersecretary of State, tried to explain the difference. All right? And he actually called it the Kennedy Doctrine. And by the way, in some of these documents that we're getting now, finally, whatever, whatever Donald Trump is going to let us have, he's obviously not going to let us have, have everything. You know, uh, Bobby Kennedy returns, re refers to it with this phrase, the, the so-called Kennedy Doctrine. The Kennedy Doctrine challenges status quo in the third world. And by doing that, it countered the Soviets, since we were also now on the side of revolutionary nationalism. Okay? With Dulles and Atchison, all right, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. They were completely against what's called a non-aligned movement. All right? With, with John Foster Dulles, he did not want to tolerate any country being non-aligned or neutral. All right? What Kennedy's going to do is he's going to change that. All right? All right, next slide, please. Uh, this is going to set the historical background. Until World War I, with few exceptions, America was largely an isolationist country. It didn't need a foreign policy establishment outside the State Department because there was not really a heck of a lot to do. In the rare instances of intervention, a war was involved, as was Spain. Next, please. Okay. But after World War I, America started to create a foreign policy establishment since it now became more and more involved in foreign affairs. All you need to know about this new establishment is that it was Senator Pratt House in New York, and Mr. Pratt was a former director of Standard Oil. In other words, very unsubtly, big business and corporations we're going to be in control of this extra government formation of these foreign policy institutions. Next, please. This organization was called the Council of Foreign Relations. It was founded in 1921, and its journal was called Foreign Affairs. The aim of the CFR, quite early, was to take over leadership of Western foreign policy from Great Britain. One of its first directors was Paul Kravitz of Kravitz, Swain, and more, which is John McCloy's law firm. And we're going to learn something about John McCloy today. Next slide, please. What did Kravitz know about world affairs? Not very much, but he was a heavy-duty Wall Street lawyer for the Morgan Empire. And the CFR would really represent American interest in foreign affairs, rather than an understanding of particular areas and what imperialism had done to those areas. That's very important, that last phrase, because this is one of the things that Kennedy would start railing against in his, when he uh, started um, from about 1951 to 1957. He specifically attacked that attitude that our State Department does not really represent 
the desires and ambitions of the people that in the area where they're living at. They're representing the colonial people who are running those areas. That's why in 1958, Kennedy bought 100 copies of the best-selling book, The Ugly American, which he loved, and he sent one to everybody else in the Senate. All right? Next slide, please. Within just a few years, the CFR had set up a web of influence between New York and Washington. The goal was to create a single world-spanning political economy with the USA at its fulcrum. This would later become the chairman, David Rockefeller's lifelong aim, which he would achieve under Bill Clinton. And that, of course, was NAFTA. Next slide, please. An accompanying goal was to educate American opinion leaders in order to gain popular support for their aims and ends. Therefore, local chapters of CFR were founded in major American cities with media leaders and businessmen on the boards. Now, we're going to see with the next three slides some examples of the influence of the CFR. Next slide. On the eight-man board which advised Truman to drop the bomb on Japan, five of its members were from the CFR. Next slide, please. Another example was when Eisenhower was president of Columbia University, he became a part-time student in the CFR study groups and an editorial advisor to Foreign Affairs magazine. And this is like that picture shows, this is when he became friendly with John Foster Dulles. Next slide, please. Henry Kissinger began his career as a research editor for a CFR study group. They published his best-selling book on this study group, which was called Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy. This is how he met Nelson Rockefeller, who promoted his career. Next slide, please. From 1945 to 72, 66% of State Department officers had been members of the CFR. CI directors Dulles, McCollum, Helms, Colby, and Bush all came from the CFR. Half of all the CFR members in 65 were business executives. John A. Whitney, Walter Riston, Rockefeller, Thomas Watson, and IBM. During World War II, a whole committee of the CFR was incorporated into the State Department. Now, some of the policies advocated by the CFR, which became formal policies of the United States, the British Empire, as it existed, will never reappear, so the United States will take its place. That one came, was written as early as 1927. All right, which it didn't formally happen until, until about 1946. America will need economic interests to regulate a world economy, like IMF and the World Bank. Again, 1942, years before their creation. Allies should go easy on Germany and not allow German reparations to supply the USSR. Again, before it happened in 1945. This one, this last one, is really kind of striking. Keep low-key low relations with South Africa, since whites are still in charge, in order to keep the businesses engaged and working. 1965, that lasted until the 90s. All right, next slide. In Southeast Asia, war with Japan is possible over Indochina as a chief source of raw materials. We must keep political power in the hands of those friendly to the United States since all nations there are interdependent. 1953, the loss of any further portion of the Far East would have this decisive effects on the balance of world power in the years ahead. That's clearly the beginning of the domino period. 
1956, in geopolitical terms, Southeast Asia is extremely significant since it occupies a position of global strategic importance comparable to Panama and Suez, which of course is complete nonsense. All right, but they're trying to make Southeast Asia into some very, very important area of American national security, which it was not. In 1963, the year Kennedy assassinated, CFR publishes a book saying Southeast Asia is essential to American security and economic needs, something that Kennedy did not agree with. All right, next slide, please. The CFR creates a public committee to support Johnson's Vietnam policies. The chairman of this group is John McCloy. Group says Johnson acted rightly and in the national interest in committing American troops into Vietnam. McCloy and David Rockefeller meet with LBJ in open support of his escalation policy. In other words, within one year of the one report, John McCloy was on board with an official reversal reversal of JFK's Vietnam policy. This one I think is really interesting. In 1967, Bayless Manning was an advisor for CBS. Do we have the next slide up? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Was an advisor for CBS while he was a dean of the Stanford Law School. CBS President Richard Salant said two CBS managers who were open for a fair debate about the Warren report to air on CBS to visit it. Manning told him that such a program was not in the national interest since it had political implications. His advice was taken and CBS did a happy job on the critics. In 1971, David Rockefeller <coughs> made Bayless Manning the first president of the Council on Foreign Relations. All right, coincidence or conspiracy? I leave that up to you. Mm. All right, next frame, please. JFK was not Eastern establishment. Owing to his Irish heritage, which he never forgot, Kennedy was not a part of the Eastern establishment. He never joined the CFR. He never joined any secret societies. He didn't like working intelligence in World War II. In fact, he got out after about six months, and he volunteered for those suicide missions in the South Pacific with those Joe Six Pack guys, and then he actually brought some of them back to the White House with them. All right? Here's another example. To show how much a party he was from this club, consider his treatment of John Whitney. Whitney was a firm ally of the Rockefellers who published a Herald Tribune. Eisenhower appointed him ambassador to England. After Kennedy was inaugurated, he wrote Whitney a rather tense, rather terse termination program. Three words, Jock, Pat, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> the night of the assassination, Whitney went to work as a so-called copy editor. Here's this guy making $700 million dollars. Okay, and he goes to work at a copy editor as his newspaper. His was the first paper to propagate the Oswald as sociopath fairy tale. All right, next slide, please. These are what I consider four of the better sources to learn some of the stuff we're talking about today. All right, the, the Richard Mahoney book, J.F. Carradale in Africa, Philip Mullen books, on bet betting on the Africans, Robert Rocco, Kennedy Johnson, and an online world, which is, that's my favorite, by the way, and Greg Paul Grain's The Incubus of Intervention. If you have not read these books, you really don't know who John Kennedy was. The Mahoney book was the first one of these I read, and it completely altered my perspective on what JFK's foreign policy was really all about. Next slide, please. Kennedy's foreign policy was formed in large part by 1961. Why do I say this? Because he met a certain diplomat many years before he became president. To show how far behind the learning curve the research community has been, this man's name was not in a, a Kennedy assassination book until the Douglas book in 2008 which means it was bottled up for 44 years. 
It's a bit astonishing considering the influence that this man had on young John Kennedy. That man, of course, is State Department official Edmund Gulligan. Next slide, please. Since Gulligan spoke French, he was transferred to Vietnam. Uh, the guy sitting off the Gulligan's uh, right there is Bao Dai, all right, the French chip leader head of South Vietnam. Next slide, please. On a visit to Saigon in 1951, Kennedy had a meeting with Gullion. Kennedy was taking a tour along with his younger brother uh, to raise his profile and knowledge about uh, America in, a, in the far flung world. So he decides to visit Saigon. Next slide, please. He has a meeting with Gullion. All right at a rooftop restaurant in Saigon, and he asks him if France is going to win the war. And Gullion says, France is not, is not going to win the war. All right? Ho Chi Minh had inspired the young men to die rather than be under the yoke of France. Of France. And France is not going to be able to win a war like that. They won't be able to win a war of attrition. All right? Because the French home front would not support it. Now, if you take a look at this, it's exactly what's going to happen in the United States, of course, years later. Right? And so JFK understood this, you know, 10 years before he entered the White House. This is why he was resistant and was not going to put combat troops into that theater. All right? Next slide, please. Gullion's ideas changed forever JFK's thinking on foreign policy. As Bobby Kennedy said after that meeting, that talk with Gullion had a deep, deep impact on his thinking. All right, next frame, please. Oh, by the way, that picture, that's Gullion in the White House. Because JFK remembered him and he brought him into the White House, all right, and Gullion became one of the chief architects of Kennedy's Congo policy, which hardly anybody ever talks about, but we, we are. All right, next frame, please. Gullion became Kennedy's point man on the great Congo struggle, which began before Kennedy was president, and it continued until after his assassination. This episode is disgracefully ignored by the JFK research book uh, group. Why is it important? It shows going in's immense influence on Kennedy and JFK's undying attempt to keep Congo free of European influence, to keep the rich region of Katanga part of Congo and not a colony of Belgium. All three protagonists of freedom were murdered by 1963. Next frame, please. There is an old cliche, a picture is worth a thousand words. To me, there is no picture in all of Kennedy's presidency worth more than the one Jock Lowe shot unbeknownst to Kennedy in the Oval Office. It was unrehearsed and it was a surprise call. That's why it reveals so much about the man who he was. Jock Lowe was one of the uh, three top White House photographers, and he came in, and they were just going to do some pose shots. You know, Kennedy, you know, sitting at his desk, Kennedy writing on some paper, etc. And so the phone call came in from Adley Stevenson. Next slide. And he told Kennedy that Lumumba was dead. Now, the reason I think this is so important is because we know that nothing that came before Kennedy and certainly nothing that came after would have that reaction, you know, to the death of a black revolutionary leader in Africa. All right. Okay. Next slide, please. We know this because Eisenhower, after conferring with Alan Dulles, ordered the assassination of Lumumba. All right. 
LBJ reversed Kennedy's policy in Congo and ordered CI Cuban exile pilots to strafe the last of Lumumba's followers. All right. Next slide, please. Congo, three murders, 1961 to 1963. Patrice Lumumba, murdered by the Belgians with the help of the CIA in 1961. All right. Number two, Dag Hammarskjöld. And with this particular one, you know, I'm not going to use the word killed anymore because I think that after Susan Williams' book, who killed Hammerskold, you know, I think the idea that he was killed has now been exposed as a cover story. All right? There's no doubt in my mind that Hammerskold was murdered, likely by the Belgians with the CIA support in a fake plane crash. And Alan Dulles is one of the names that is now used as part of that plot. And of course, JFK murdered by the CIA and his allies, including the mob in 1963. Next slide, please. Harry Truman in 1961. Dag Hammarskjöld, by the way, it's a direct quote in the New York Times. Dag Hammarskjöld was on the point of getting something done when they killed him. Notice that I said, when they killed him. A rather remarkable quote, right? <laughs> For 1961. I mean, all right, so why, why did Truman say this? Well, we didn't find out until, as, we, as these things usually were, we didn't find out until about 40 or 50 years later, all right? Because, next slide, because it was later revealed to Greg Polgrain that Hammersfeld and Kennedy had made a secret alliance to keep both Congo and Indonesia out of the hands of imperial powers. What is remarkable, I mean really remarkable about this, is that JFK shouldered that burden himself after Hammerskull was murdered. Usually when you make a promise to somebody and the other guy dies, you don't feel obliged to keep it up. Well, that's not the way Kennedy felt about Hammerskull. Alright? He was going to go ahead and keep this up even though his fallen friend, you know, was not there anymore. And in fact, he, he actually told the Swedish attaché um, after Hammerskjöld died that as far as he was concerned, Hammerskjöld was the greatest statesman of the 20th century. And he said, compared to him, I'm a pygmy. He then went to the UN, first of all, how many presidents go to the UN today anyway? Yeah. All right. But Sag, he went twice. He went twice. In order to keep up the effort in the Congo. Until finally, American troops were committed, along with several other nations, in order to keep Katanga a part of the Congo. All right. Next slide, please. <coughs> Patrice Lumumba became a hero in Africa, not because he promoted socialism, which he did not, but because he resisted foreign intervention. He stood up to the outsiders, if only by getting himself killed. And he is, by the way, in Africa. There are streets named after him, there's plazas named after him, there's statues of him, right? Why do you... Next slide, please. Why are those three murders so important? Because once they were completed, Kennedy's policy was completely reversed. The CIA took over the American embassy and started a secret air war to eliminate the last of Lumumba's followers. Congo became a vassal state to Belgium and England, and the rich Katanga did not go to the Congolese people, as Kennedy wanted. They went to dictator Mobutu and his imperial employers. Next slide, please. And that was not just a one-up kind of thing. It happened again in Indonesia. 
the other place where Kennedy and Hammerstrom had made a deal about. The exact same pattern occurred in Indonesia as in Congo. Eisenhower and the Douglas brothers attempted a coup, a coup, a, approved a coup attempt to overthrow Sukarno in 1958. When Kennedy became president, he asked for reform in this action. Douglas gave him a redacted version. You know, we complain about getting redacted versions. Well, so did Kennedy got a redacted version of the report, too. Once he read it, Kennedy exclaimed, no wonder Sukarno doesn't like us. We tried to overthrow his government. Next slide, please. Kennedy was determined to make an alliance with the leftist Sukarno. He assigned RFK and Aldrich Bunker to negotiate the return of West Iran to Indonesia from the Netherlands. <clears throat> Indonesia actually didn't own West Iran, but Sukarno thought it should have been part of the Indonesia archipelago. All right. Without this influence, in other words, without RFK and Aldrich Bunker, it's very doubtful that West Iran would have ever been returned to Indonesia. Next slide, please. Why is this important? West Irian is even richer than Katanga. Kennedy wanted his wealth to go to the people of Indonesia. Just one mine in that area, the Grossberg mine, does almost $3 billion a year in gold, silver, and copper deposits. And that was in 2006. Multiply that sum by about 40 years, and you'll see what was at stake there for the power elite. And by the way, this has gone into, in, the, in Greg Polgrain's book, okay, Incubus, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the Incubus of Intervention, all right, where he shows how these assets were disguised, okay, by the Dutch, so that neither the United States nor Indonesia would know how much the island was really worth, all right? Next slide, please. And so the familiar pattern repeats itself. After Kennedy befriends a third world leader, and in fact promises to visit him in his homeland, the CIA and LBJ reverse this policy with disaster results from native population. And this is what I mean. See, this would be an example of what George Ball was talking about, the Kennedy doctrine. Okay? We were not going to try and stamp out third world nationalism. We were going to try and encourage it. But after, after Kennedy's death, this is all reversed. Within 18 months of JFK's assassination, the CRI plots to overthrow Sukarno and decimate the PKI, his communist based party. This takes place in the fall of 1965 and is the bloodiest CIA coup in history. Perhaps as many as 400,000, and if anything, that number is too low, okay, of the PKI are murdered. Another brutal dictator, Suharto, comes to power. The wealth of West Iran does not go to Indonesia, but to Suharto and his imperial allies. So, there's a parallel with Congo right there. All right, next slide, please. Kennedy continued and expanded the CIA program to arm the Tibetan rebels to fight against the Chinese invasion of 1952, a program that Mao thought India was backing by giving asylum to the Dalai Lama. Next slide, please. When Mao invaded India in October of 1962 over this program, Kennedy began a daily airlift of arms and supplies to prevent China from overrunning India. Eight flights a day into Calcutta, each flight made up of 20 tons of arms and ammo. The remarkable thing about this, this takes place during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So Kennedy is managing two of these at the same time. All right, next slide please. JFK got England to go along with him in this program and they both warned Pakistani leader Ayub Khan not to encourage or join Mao in his attack on Nehru in India, even though Pakistan and India were already very uh, harsh rivals. Next, next slide, please. 
JFK increased the airlift supplies through November, and he proposed sending the Navy into the Bay of Bengal and an aircraft carrier fleet into Madras province. The day after this, Mao decides to withdraw and offer a truce. Now, whether those are related or not, I don't know. Some people really don't think that Mao was determined to actually overrun the country, that he just was teaching them a lesson. All right. Now, what's important about this, next slide, please. What's important about this, this policy of favoring India <clears throat> over Pakistan is reversed when JFK is killed because both Johnson and really Nixon will tilt towards Pakistan. See, Kennedy favored India because he thought, okay, we have this giant country that we can use as a counterweight. It's a democratic country to China. That's why he sent his good friend, John Kenneth Galbraith, to be the ambassador there. Next frame, please. The shifting towards Pakistan will lead to two momentous events. Number one, the genocide in East Pakistan, commonly called Bangladesh, in 1971, which Nixon and Kissinger did not just ignore. They actually aided by smuggling jet planes from Iran to Pakistan. It's a really amazing, it's an amazing piece of history if you don't know anything about this. There's a very good book on it by a guy named Gary Bass called The Blood Telegram. It's called that because Archer Blood was the head of the embassy there and he wrote a, me a memo to the White House describing what was happening and saying the United States should not should stand by and watch this. When he got no response, he did something even more extraordinary. He got 21 employees in that embassy to sign another telegram. All right? And it did, of course, as we know, nothing. Secondly, the use of Pakistan as a base to battle the Soviets in Afghanistan, which leads to the rise of a man named Osama bin Laden. Okay, next frame, please. The tilt towards Pakistan brings us now to what is perhaps most relevant for today's world, Kennedy's Middle East policy. How many people even knew Kennedy had a Middle East policy? You won't read about it anywhere. And, you know, as I said, it's not these Kennedy books because all they talk about is Cuba and Vietnam, like nothing else matters, right? We did have such a policy, and Kennedy built that policy, as he usually did, in opposition to what came before him, what Dulles and Eisenhower were doing. Okay, next frame, please. All right. Kennedy's key to the Middle East is this guy, Gamal Abdel Nasser. All right. He had been frozen out by Dulles, Sean Foster Dulles, because number one, he recognized China. Number two, he would not join the Baghdad Pact. He essentially said, you know, look, if I join the Baghdad Pact, this was one of those treaty things that Dulles had set up all over the world to fight the communists, you know, everywhere. And if, then I'm just going to be looked upon as a lackey in the United States, you know. I owe my political career to the fact that I, I represent Egyptians, all right? So he wouldn't join. So then Dulles cut off the funding for the Aswan Dam, and that went ahead and forced Nasser to go to the Soviets. Well, Kennedy thought that was really stupid. Why do we want to do that? We want to try and keep this guy as our, as our friend. So again, this is part of the Kennedy doctrine in the Third World. You know, we're going to back revolutionary nationalism, all right? And by doing that, we're going to counter the Soviets, all right? So his idea was we're going to freeze out Saudi Arabia and Iran, okay? They're too, too dictatorial and backward-looking. 
we're going to create a bond with Nassar, who Kennedy perceived as being more secular, democratic, and progressive. And by doing this, we're going to create the impression of fairness and not favoring either side. All right? In other words, we can now be looked upon with trust on both sides. Together with Nasser, we're going to form a union with other Arab moderate states. And then we'll move towards a solution to the Palestinian problem in a second term. Lastly, we're going to keep atomic weapons out of the area. And JFK was really adamant about that last point. All right. All right, next slide, please. Kennedy was firmly opposed to monarchies like the Shah and also King Saud in Saudi Arabia. The Kennedy brothers were very dissatisfied with the Shah of Iran. As was Saud, they saw his monarchy as being out of touch with the masses, cronyish and opposed to civil rights. Kennedy commissioned a State Department study of the costs and liabilities of returning Mossadegh to power in Iran, all right? which of course would be another reversal of the Dulles position. The Shah knew the study was about Mossadegh was not just talk. The oh. Kennedys wanted the Shah to expand economic opportunity and civil rights. So in 1963, the Shah launched a reform movement called the White Revolution to give land to peasants and grant more rights to women. Next slide, please. As James Bill notes in his book, The Eagle and the Lion, the pressure on the Shah was greatly lessened by Johnson, and especially Nixon and Carter, because all three presidents' connections to the Rockefellers, who had much invested in the Shah's survival by any means, which of course means one word, oil. LBJ was close to Nelson Rockefeller. Henry Kissinger, Nixon's national security advisor, owed his career to David Rockefeller, as did Zevenu. Brzezinski, who was Carter's national security advisor. Next frame, please. After, RFK, after JFK's death, the Shah felt close enough to the White House to request that dissidents in the USA be deported back. RFK interceded to halt the proceedings, and the students wrote him later that he probably saved their lives. Next frame, please. Kennedy never cared for David Rockefeller's globalist designs, but there is no doubt that Alan Dulles and John McCloy were Rockefeller disciples. It was not Jimmy Carter's decision to let the Shah into the USA. That decision was pushed on him by John McCloy, who was being paid royally to do so by David Rockefeller. Next frame, please. Since Carter resisted his overtures, McCloy decided to pick off his advisors one by one. Warnke, Cy Vance, Fritz Mondale, they now joined Brzezinski. And Carter was now cornered, but before he came in, he turned and asked, all right, just answer me this. What are you guys gonna advise me to do when they invade our embassy and take our employees hostage? All right, which of course is what happened with cataclysm results. Okay, next frame, please. The move by Rockefeller and McCoy, which is so much to bring us Ronald Reagan, was previewed back in 1964. In the fall of 1963, David Rockefeller wanted to meet with JFK about planning an overthrow of the government of Brazil. Kennedy refused to take that meeting, but in December, Johnson did and the coup in Brazil began in the spring of 64. The point man for the Rockefeller and the CIA was McCloy at the same time he was sitting on the Warren Commission. So that's two of Kennedy's policies that McCloy was involved in reversing in 1964 and 1965. Next frame, please. The reversals of Kennedy's policies had cataclysmic results because Saudi Arabia now became a secret sponsor to terrorism. 
after the explosion of Islamic religious fanaticism, Kennedy feared, broke out in Iran in 1979. Next, Frank, please. Because it was important to his policy, JFK was intent on keeping nuclear arms out of the Middle East. When he learned that Ben-Gurion and Golda Meir were lying to him about the Demona reactor, he was furious and vowed he would obstruct it with every means at his disposal. Next frame, please. This policy was also overturned upon Kennedy's death. He wrote letters to Ben-Gurion specifically warning about the issue, but neither LBJ nor Nixon voiced any objections to Israel acquiring atomic weapons. Right? This is really remarkable when you think about it, okay? Uh, because LBJ knew that the Demona reactor was going to be active within a few months, and he did, didn't really say anything about it. Nixon knew about it, and he had a wink and a nod deal with the Israelis. All right? If you don't talk about it, we won't say anything about it. All right, next frame, please. This betrayal of Kennedy's policy was made even worse because Israel likely stole the uranium for its first bomb from a nuclear processing plant in America. It was called NUMEC and it was located north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A very good book on that subject is Roger Manson's Stealing the Atom Bomb. Next frame, please. This legacy, the switching of his policies in the Middle East, was completed by the tilting towards Saudi Arabia and the overall imbalance towards Israel. Therefore, when the outburst of Islamist radicalism exploded in 1979, as Kennedy predicted way back in his 1957 Algeria speech, there was no real check on it. In fact, all the conditions were there to make it grow in mushroom. And it really, well, I don't have to tell anybody how that was done that. These reversals were, next frame please. These reversals were consciously begun by LBJ and completed by Nixon after the death of RFK. Jerry Ford supplied the final coup de grace. Cheney and Rumsfeld thought Kissinger and Nixon were too moderate especially towards the Soviets. Therefore, people like Wolfowitz and Nitze were brought in to do battle with and steer the CIA to the right on the threat posed by the USSR. That was called Team B. Next frame. Ford did this with the help of CIA Director Bush, <coughs> and this is how the neocon revolution began, and the rise of the likes of Richard Pearl. They thought that not only Kissinger, but also Alexander Hay was too moderate. You can see how crazy these people were if you think Hay was too moderate, right? And with this, JFK's foreign policy became a relic in a museum. You know, something to be excavated and explicated by future scholars on Sunday mornings on calls from Los Angeles to London. All right, and that's where it exists today. All right, next frame, please. And that is how we got this. Uh, we can no. give you uh, the uh, slide. We'll put it up. slide. Is there anyone who's got a question yeah. for Jim? Right, Peter. That that Paul Grain book, uh, Incubus of Intervention. Uh, I've got that given me uh, to read, and I've read it. But I tried to get hold of my own copy in the UK, and it's like rocking off paper. I just wondered if uh, uh, if Jim knows it's available in the, in the states. Can, uh, can you repeat the question for me? The uh, book, The Incubus of Invention, is it available in the States because you've been trying to get hold yeah, of it? Yeah, I actually, I actually think you can get that book, okay, on Amazon, all right? Yeah, you, I think you can get that book. It's not easy, but, but I actually think you can. All 
right? Probably expensive. David? Does, does the CFR still exist? And oh, if yeah. so, to what extent is it linked with PNAC? <coughs> Does the CFR is the question, does the CFR still exist? Yeah. Yes. And, 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 and if so, to what extent is it linked with PNAC, if indeed PNAC still exists? Is it connected with PNAC, and does PNAC still exist? No, PNAC doesn't exist anymore. The CFR exists today, and it's just as powerful now as it was back then, because what they've done is that they've expanded their membership to include many, many, many media people in it. You'd be surprised at how many media people are in the CFR. Like this Max Boot guy, you know, who just published a 700 page book about how, you know, uh, JFK dumping Lansdale was a big mistake for Vietnam. I think it's called The Road Not Taken. Well, you know, he's a CFR guy, and of course, the New York Times backed that book, all right, and it became a bestseller, if you can believe it. So yes, they're still around, and they're still very, very influential. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah one more thing to that, please. For, forgive me. Um, do we have a name for any follow-up organization, successor organization to PNAC? Did you get that? No, can you repeat the question? Are there any successes to PNAC, organization-wise? Oh, well, believe me, all of these right-wing neoconservative groups, you know, are extremely well-organized, okay? And uh, they operate out of these so-called right-wing think tanks, okay, which are spread all throughout the United States, like the Heritage Foundation and stuff like that, you know? PNAC, I don't think, has a direct successor because they really, when the in invasion went, you know, crazy like it did, they really disbanded. They tried to erase the fact that they even existed. Okay, <laughs> you know, but uh, so that is they, that one they kind of blew away. So I don't think there's going to be another direct successor to them, although their aims are car are being carried out by these other groups that the right wing has in the United States. Okay. Right. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, Kennedy was against the Shah of Iran and didn't get under the Shah of Iran. What did he, if, if he feared Islamic revolutionists, uh, which of course did happen in 1979, as you said, what did he expect to happen in Iran if, he, if the Shah had fallen earlier? All right. That's a very interesting question. That's a very interesting question. See, if you study the history of the Middle East, which I did, okay, when I started this, there's a very fascinating book called The Devil's Game by a guy named Dreyfus. And what he does is, in that book, is he illuminates this battle between the fundamentalists in the Middle East and the progressive secularists in the Middle East, okay? And it, it, in that book, he actually says that the last great hope for American policy to oppose the fundamentalists was Nasser. All right. See, the fundamentalists in the Middle East were funded as far back as the 1920s by the British. All right, the Muslim Brotherhood, especially, very, very influential group. All right, and the British gave them a lot of money to spread their word, to spread into other countries, etc. And the reason for this, of course, was quite simple, is that they felt that as long as the area was governed by people like the Saudi royal family, 
that it would be easier for them to deal with petroleum through their giant conglomerate BP. All right? Because if some nationalist charismatic leader got hold of this stuff, all right, then he would see what a great asset it was, and if the guy turned out to be a pan-Arabist, like Nasser was, he would demand higher and higher deals for his people to put the money to work for the Arab people as a whole. You know, this same thing as Mulumba, same thing as Sakar. So they decided their strategy would be to secretly back these groups. All right? Well, see, in Canada's eyes, all right, somebody like um, the Shah would be sort of like a sitting duck for these guys. All right? Okay, because he didn't offer anything except his monarchy. All right? And so what he wanted him to do was to be more like Nasser. Okay? And that's what he was trying to do there. And that's why he seriously thought of bringing back Mossadegh. And by the way, most people don't understand how close that decision came. Okay? It, and it, at the very last minute, after that State Department paper was passed around, Kennedy decided not to do it. Because to him, he thought the cost and liabilities of bringing him back, you know, would be too dangerous. Okay? Well, obviously, <clears throat> in retrospect, maybe that was wrong. Okay? All right? Because a after, like I said, after 63, all the pressure was relaxed. You know, and Sabak and his security forces, you know, ended up this violent, repressive, you know, kind of attitude towards anybody who wanted to modernize the country. So that, that was his strategy there. And that was his strategy in Saudi Arabia. He didn't want to deal with Saudi Arabia at all. Okay? And, and of course, Dulles, you know, had turned towards Saudi Arabia as a counterweight against Nasser. All right? All right, and so that's why I mean it was a reversal of the whole Dulles position there. All right? So it, it was, it, this, this whole issue is very fascinating. And it's really surprising to me, you know, that, you know, why do we have to wait to meet? Okay. <laughs> I'm the guy who got into this community by studying Jim Garrison, you know, all those years ago. And we've never talked about this subject as far as I know until now, you know. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Jim. Thank you very much, Jim.